Isn't that an amazing video? I'd like to thank my friends at the National Geographic, Chris Johns, who's also an Oregonian, and cinematographer Greg Wilson, and the producer Kim Hubbard for allowing us to show that. And that was taken at Cincinnati Zoo, and one of my very dear cheetah friends. But I guess I have cheetah friends everywhere. Um, in 1974, when I was in my early 20s, I uh, found myself in Winston, Oregon. I was actually one of the pioneers of the Oregon wine industry, and I uh, had the third bonded winery here in Oregon. And I'd moved up to Oregon from Napa, California. I had my dairy goat herd with me, and I was coming to the new frontier for Oregon wine. I was educated in Napa as a viticulturist and an enologist, which is a grape grower and a winemaker. However, I grew up on a farm, riding horses, and I was a veterinary assistant. So when I moved to Winston, and I had a, my, my winery, I needed a job to support my business, and <laughs> driving up the I-5, I saw billboards that had cheetahs on them. And the first place I stopped was at the Wildlife Safari. So I got a job in Winston, Oregon, right near where my winery was, and the cheetahs changed my life. Do you know where the Wildlife Safari is? Yeah. <laughs> well, just three hours south of here, we have one of the most amazing wildlife parks in the entire world. And I've seen the world, and this is the best. Well, I helped develop it. I was there for about 16 years. <laughs> Very proud. Um, but actually, it's kind of stole my life, and it stole my heart. And that's where I first found out about cheetahs. Nobody knew very much about them. Pretty soon I was running the veterinary clinic, and I was just amazed. And everything I found out about cheetahs, people you know, would write me around the world and say, when you find out more about cheetahs, let us know. Well, next thing you know, I found out I was the expert on cheetahs in the world. Kings, princes, emperors had revered cheetahs for thousands of years, and yet we were losing the species before our very eyes. Um, so during the years that I developed um, the most successful breeding center for cheetahs in the United States, and Winston's still one of the most successful breeding centers in the world, um, I finally realized that I needed to do something else if we were really going to try to save the cheetah. Now, here I'm actually pictured with two of my very special charges, and that's Munchkin, who's a gibbon ape, um, and Kayam with me. And Kayam is actually the cheetah that gave me a vision and showed me the way to save them. Well, what if we lost the cheetah? What if this magnificent animal, the icon for speed and elegance in nearly every culture, what if it disappeared from Earth? Well, first of all, this becomes the world's fastest land animal. And it's just not the same. <laughs> Fast as a pronghorn antelope? Just doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? So he can't lose the cheetah for that. But it goes way beyond that. Oh, if we lose the cheetahs, entire ecosystems throughout the cheetah's range in Africa and India lose one of their critical predators. And the cheetah, it's going fast. In the last 100 years, we've lost 90% of the world's population of cheetahs. This is Namibia, and it's home to the largest population of wild cheetahs in the world. And I now live there. I live out of the town called Ochivarongo, which means where the fat cattle grow. And it's where I've developed the International Research Center for Cheetahs. How I got there, though, was in 1977, I um, brought Kayam, who had been born here in Oregon and I'd hand-raised, over to Namibia to do groundbreaking research to find out if a captive-born cheetah could learn how to hunt. Well, nothing that I had experienced prepared me for actually what I saw when I arrived there. 
When I first arrived, I found farmers trapping and shooting cheetahs. They were killing hundreds of cheetahs every year. In the 1980s alone, they halved the cheetah population in Namibia, killing nearly 10,000 animals. I had to find out why the farmers were killing them. Was it actually because they were killing their livestock? Was it a perceived threat, an actual threat? Or was it the fact that they needed more education and to learn about the cheetah? In 1990, I set up the Cheetah Conservation Fund, and I moved from my then job at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. I sold all my worldly belongings, and I moved to Namibia. And from there, I visited farmers. I went door to door, farm to farm. Our next door neighbor is like an hour and a half away, so very great distances. I was in an old beat up Land Rover. Of course, you have to have one if you go over to Africa. Um, and I talked to the livestock farmers. They were raising cattle, goats, and sheep. But growing up on a farm, I really felt that I understood them. And actually, I got a lot of credibility because I'd say to them, well, you know, over in the United States, I was a goat judge. And I was, I did. I traveled all around the country judging people's goats. <laughs> I like goats a lot. <laughs> um, and most of the commercial farmers raised cattle, and the communal farmers had goats and sheep. The farmers, though, many of them were very, very poor. And even losing one sheep actually meant a disaster for their family's livelihood. And cheetahs were not this you know, elegant icon of speed and grace that we think of. The farmers considered them to be vermin. And they preyed on their goats and their sheep. And they should be shot on sight. And there is no way that I could convince them to save a cheetah if I couldn't really help them with their livelihoods. And a lot of that really looked at livestock management and wildlife management. I had to really come up with some real solutions to their problems if they were going to help me save the cheetah. This is Chewbacca. And he was orphaned when he was 10 days old. And he's been my best friend for um, 16 years. He passed away a couple years ago, unfortunately. But he lived a very long life. But Chewbacca met everyone who visited our research and education center. And he helped me educate farmers. He helped me educate a nation. I asked myself, what if I could show farmers that saving cheetahs was actually the key to prosperity for them and their neighbors? Suddenly, it wasn't just about saving the cheetah anymore. It became looking at how to save whole systems, everything within a system. And the cheetah was just the beginning, the focal point, the cat to list. <laughs> at CCF, we've developed a range of integrated programs on the premise that saving the cheetah involves saving everything else including humans. And so when it comes to people and cheetahs, two things really needed to happen. Fostering education about cheetahs and growing the economy of the people living alongside cheetahs. We've provided education um, about the cheetah to farmers, to school learners, to conservation biologists throughout the cheetah's range, so that they have a better idea of the role that the cheetah plays in the ecosystem and how its very presence in Africa can foster travel and tourism. And we welcome everyone to come over to Namibia and visit us. But one of our most successful programs in the work that we've done to date has been our Livestock Guarding Dog Program. These are Kangle Dogs, or Anatolian Shepherds, and they grow up with the goats and sheep. They're a breed that's been successfully raising and guarding flocks in Turkey for about 5,000 years. And they've done it to protect the flocks against the wolves and bears. Now, I first learned about these breeds of dog here in Oregon in the 1970s, when the farmers were getting these dogs in to protect their sheep from coyotes. We need more Anatolians in Oregon here today as well. In Namibia, we breed them. And I've given out over 400 of these dogs to Namibian farmers. We teach them how the dogs work. Our research shows that farmers that have our dogs have reduced their livestock loss from not just the cheetah, but all the predators 
by over 80 up to 100%. So the farmers are less worried about the cheetahs as a threat, and then they're less likely to kill the cheetah when they see it. We're providing resources and techniques so that farmers can have a better um, life for their families. Instead of now these children going out and hurting the dogs, the goats, they're actually able to go to schools. And these are the kinds of issues that we deal with over in Africa. In Namibia, we run a model farm now where uh, we raise cattle, goats, and sheep, our livestock guarding dogs, and our farm serves as a teaching opportunity for Namibian farmers. We test predator-friendly farming and sustainable land use techniques and also explore alternative income streams. Now, this is our creamery that we just opened. Uh, I told you I like goats. And you have to have goats in order to raise the dogs, so I now, with lots of dogs, ha get to have lots of goats. And we've developed um, a, a creamery to be able to make um, goat cheese and ice cream and fudge from the milk from our dairy goats. And we're now teaching Namibians that they can do the same things and providing these kinds of income streams um, to rural and marginalized farmers has actually providing alternative livelihoods or incomes to our local community. Now, one of our most ambitious efforts to date has been um, our habitat restoration project called Bush Block. Namibia suffers from a encroachment of bush. It's a form of desification and it's a result of the overgrowth of the native thorn bushes, often caused by overgrazing of the grasslands by livestock in a very arid environment. Now, the cheetah hunts using bursts of speed, and the presence of this thick bush thwarts their hunting and causes injuries, particularly to their eyes, running through that thick bush. The bush encroachment also affects our nation's economy. Thornbush in Namibia covers almost 120 million acres of land. Now that's about one and a half times the size of Oregon, an area a bit larger than Montana and a bit smaller than California. And the bush encroachment is just so bad. Um, it's reduced our uh, available grazing land for the livestock and the wildlife. And the economic loss of this agriculture to the agriculture sector annually is almost 200 million US dollars. So the biggest problem for me, though, really revolved around that the farmers couldn't kill the bush, and so they were killing more cheetahs. And all the farmers that I talked to would say, well, we can't stop killing cheetahs because all this bush is reducing our income. So I thought, well, what if? we could transform all of this thorn bush into something useful. Well, my time in Southern Oregon taught me a lot about the timber industry. And I started to investigate how we could harvest the thorn bush sustainably and create a high energy, low emission fuel log that now we produce at our factory in Ochivarongo that employs over 30 Namibians and we're Forest Stewardship Council certified which is very important in the forestry business. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our Bush Block team. And Bush Block is the kind of initiative or innovation that's possible when conservationists and business people reach past the assumption that wildlife conservation comes at the uh, expense of economic growth. In fact, if you're willing to get creative, conservation initiatives can be a source of economic growth. And that's what we are trying to teach our Namibian farmers. And actually, much of what we're doing is working. Attitudes are changing. And where the cheetah was once regarded as vermin, communities are now proud to be the home of the world's largest population of cheetahs. And Namibia today is recognized as the cheetah capital of the world. This attracts thousands of visitors to our country and into our community every year. <laughs> I'm homesick. <laughs> um, you see, there's less than 10,000 cheetahs left in the world today. And while we've been very successful in Namibia, 
We're working now throughout the Cheetah's range, and we need to do a lot more a lot faster, because if we're not successful, the Cheetah could disappear from the Earth in the next 20 years. I didn't start out to become who I am today. I met a cheetah, it changed my life. <laughs> Meeting a cheetah, falling in love with a cheetah gave me a mission um, and it's given me a focus. And you may have noticed in that video that we were watching early on that the body of the cheetah, it was moving and the tail was moving, but the eyes were fixed, the face was fixed directly on what um, what it was going after, its target. With laser focus, nothing else matters. And that's what's made the cheetah a successful predator. And it's that kind of focus that's allowed me to do exactly what I've done. So I'm not so very different from anyone else. I just wake up every day with a mission, a single focus, to save the cheetahs. What I've learned is that you can do the most extraordinary things if you're willing to pursue your objective with that kind of focus and determination, just like a cheetah. But what I've learned is saving the cheetah really means changing the world so that the cheetah can survive. Now, I'd like to introduce you to one of my close friends, and I have I guess maybe 10,000 cheetah friends in the world. Um, and the cheetah that is going to come out was born at the Wildlife Safari in, down in Winston, and I hope that you'll all come to Winston to visit not only this cheetah, and this is Kayam II, who is named after my Kayam, Kayam I. And if you go down into Winston, there's one stoplight and there's a big statue of Kayam I there. But I really encourage everybody to um, learn about the cheetah. And I wanted to bring the cheetah here for you to see and understand what's given me my purpose in life and my focus. So ladies and gentlemen, and all of you here in the Rose City and around the world, what if we lost the cheetah? And I'd like you to hear from the cheetah's voice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, you're welcome to come up and say hello. You can't pet, but um, we welcome you to come a little closer. Or please do go down to the Wildlife Safari and visit um, all of our friends down there. Or come over to Namibia, and you can um, help us save cheetahs. We, uh, we welcome you over in Namibia as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lurie.